Jack. Earlier, earlier today, Jack and I were talking. For those of you who don't know, one of the smartest guys in the field, Jack Daniels. Uh, we were talking about education, and we started really kind of talking at the meta level. And then I got sucked into doing this, and it was like, what am I going to do? I'm going to do this at the meta level. And one of the problems that I've noticed uh, over the last 30 years of doing this is the educational system sucks. And I'm not just talking about the uh, uh, grade one, two, three, let's leave every kid behind so they can read like the former president. If you're Republicans, I'm sorry, it was a cheap shot, but necessary. <laughs> but we're in the world of security, we were talking also about we're not teaching history. How many of you know how to draw out a Bell Lapodula reference model schematic. Why would you want to? <laughs> <laughs> I can Google it. I can Google it. <laughs> what we're going to talk about today is how I grew up. I grew up in an analog world. Who? Serious question. How many of you know what analog really means? Yeah, you do. I know you. All right. What's analog? Uh, there are a couple of different No. What's analog? No, no, too much information. What's analog? Not digital. Not digital. Not digital. <laughs> the metaphor I always used is analog is round wheels, digital is square wheels. And we grew up, I grew up, analog engineering with tubes and biasing transistors and all of this stuff. The first computer I ever built was an analog computer that was on the cover of popular whatever the hell it was when it was popular in the late 50s, early 60s. And it semi sort of kind of worked, but I learned a great deal. Then I went into the rock and roll field and did analog engineering, and it was audio and video, and we had synchronization, and the synchronization, believe it or not, was analog synchronization. And I got a couple of prezos that are, I think I did a couple of Skydog Con, kind of going through the nightmares of what we went through. So over the last several years, I've gotten more and more thinking and realizing from a thought standpoint, we have very little new ideas on how to approach security thinking, whether it's practitioners at the operational level, designers at the coding level, or just overarching thinking about security problems. We know a couple of things. We know the internet's broken. We know that security's broken. We know that doing the same crap over and over and over again is what we're doing, and it's still res resulting in the same mess that we've been in for 30 years, no matter what new technology comes along. We need something new. So the reason I mentioned Bell Lapodula is that was the first official mathematically provable security model that was developed in the 1970s. And it had its place, absolutely, and I argue it still does have its place, but we can get into that discussion a little bit later. Overall, I realize that everything we've been doing has been fundamentally flawed. And I use the following statement. Digital is not binary. Think about that. I see a lot of eyes. Digital is not binary, and I wish I had my slide deck because it's a lot prettier than my stick figure challenge stuff I'm going to be showing you. So it's from an analog approach is how I'm going to look at what we're talking about and seeing can we apply fundamental 101 analog engineering concepts to the security of digital networks and end up with a different answer than buying a new IDS. We're selling technology. The vendors are selling technology, and technology is a piece of it, but it's not all of it as we have come to learn over the years. So we're going to begin with something fairly simple. We are going to be thieves. You are going to steal from a jewelry store. Now imagine this jewelry store that got a nice window, and there's jewels and all the crap in there, and you want to rob it. Their firewall is a pane of glass. How much protection does that provide their network of jewelry? Depends upon the glass. I'm a former consultant. Oh, you're a former consultant. That means you must be still at home. How much protection does that pane of glass provide us? 
Likely not much is the correct answer. See, three-word answers do. That's what we're going to be working on for you for the rest of the day. <laughs> Likely not much. Yet that is the amount of protection that that jewelry store offers. So the bad guys go in and rob that. They throw a brick. In your super window case, they throw a bigger brick. <laughs> Fair enough. What is the only thing, the only thing that matters after that? One word. Mitigated control, Mitigated control is one word. Where did you go to school? Um, Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> the one word is somebody always with a stop clock, isn't there? Why? Time. Because the protection is non-existent. The only thing that exists is what we can actually measure in our networks. And I'm going to show you something. Time, number one, unless you want to start playing Planck's distance and talk quantum with me, anything greater than minus 40 second in time is analog by definition. Anything smaller than that becomes quantized digital Planck's distance, Planck's times things. So time is an analog function. So when we have with protection, in the jewelry store, we're going to have this P. And under there, we're going to call it a sub T for time. But we have next to no protection because it's only a pane of glass and we've all got a lot of bricks. But what happens as soon as that pane of glass is broken? What's the next thing that occurs in a well-designed jewelry store? The alarm goes off? No. What happens before the alarm goes off? What? <laughs> the, jewel, the jewels are out the door. Hell yeah, they are by now. But what happens in their security system? What's the next step? No, not the police. The what? Automated tourists. Automated tourists. No. <laughs> what happens is deep a detection of some sort. Is it acoustic? Is it thermal? Is it breaking the tape? Whatever it is, it is a detection. IDS, you know, we think about these things. So, the detection, we're going to have in measure in time for a second. How long does it take that pane of tape, the sonic alarm, the thermal, how long does that take to actually occur. One second to a microsecond. So we have a order of magnitude of three, ten to the third. So we're going to call it one second for argument's sake. Fair enough. That's a slow electron going down a wire. After the detection occurs, what happens? Response happens. And we're going to do a sub-T here as well. How long does it take the cops to get there? <laughs> Where, where's the coffee shop? <laughs> if it's Detroit, you need a candle. What would a smart bad guy have done? Timed it. Timed it? Uh, what would a smart guy have done? Anybody here an engineer? He would have tested it. You set off fake alarms in the neighborhood. Is it a donut-eating donut -eating crew? Is it midnight? Is it shift change? At what point and how long should the guy with the stopwatch care? So we have three components here. And I'm going to give response time. I'm going to give it 99 seconds because it makes my math really easy to do. <laughs> We have no protection in this jewelry store. So we have to assume for the moment that that's equaling a big zero. Our safest assumption. Because we know a brick's going to come through it sooner or later. Our entire hope in our security model then becomes a fairly simple formula of DT plus RT, which yields in this case, we'll say, a hundred seconds. So the bad guys got a hundred seconds to grab as much crap as they possibly can before they get out. Is this a digital function or an analog function? Only 
a guy with the gray hair knew it was analog. <laughs> it's an analog function. So let's convert this for a moment to our networks. We all have firewalls. We all have IDSs. We all have all this crap. So let's take our firewall. How many people have bought them from major firewall companies? Show of hands. OK. In your purchase agreement, how much time does the vendor guarantee it'll work? <laughs> Wait, I see two zeros here. And if they're guaranteeing zero already, you should be picking another vendor. How much time will that firewall hold up under an attack? Right? We don't know. Because there's so many things that can go wrong from bad code to bad configuration to all sorts of stuff that we're not going to get into the noise level on. So again, we need to assume, for argument's sake, it's zero. We all have an IDS, hopefully, of some sort. We all have sensors, hopefully, somewhere in our networks. How many of you have ever tested how long your detection actually takes? Not one. One. You've measured it. How long does it take? Depending on how the sim is running between 5 to 25 seconds. 5 to 25 seconds. All right, so we're going to add it up here. And we're just going to, we'll say 15 seconds so we, you know, we can just use some modeling here. After your SIM does its thing, does it call the cops? Does it send an email? What does it do for response? Uh, depending on the alert, it'll send an email or it'll just create a meta event uh, called defense or an, an alarm. Or an alarm. And how long does that take? Probably about another 10 to 15 seconds. Alright, we're going to say 15 just because I, I don't want to do fancy math stuff here. So right now, what you're telling me, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you have no firewall, no passwords, no nothing, the maximum exposure to your networks is 30 seconds on a particular vectored attack. Oh, now you want somebody to look at it. OK, how much more time do you want to add to that? All right, well, so you want to call that Monday morning. Point is, this gives us the basis for measuring security. Fundamentally very simple, that if you have good sensors, we're not going to get into the granularity yet, and you have good reaction times, what's going on here in your protection, because we don't know, almost becomes meaningless, but it does yield us a formula. And that formula basically says, if your vendor will guarantee to you that it will protect against a sustained attack of unknown or known quantities and vectors is greater than the amount of time it takes to both detect and react and which means mitigate, you then have a reasonably secure environment. The mathematics is fairly simple on this. But how can you guarantee for uh, slowing down an attack of an attack? I didn't say you could. That's why you go back to what ends up happening because we know that we cannot guarantee P, we end up with a new number here, which is D plus R equals E. When we do that in time, E it becomes our exposure. And we have three types of exposures, integrity, confidentiality, and availability, back from the original work in the 70s. So in your networks, again, you can build the tools for this or I'm hopefully going to be releasing some at some point, your detection and reaction time should be measurable in an analog domain. Yes, sir? There are some attack vectors that are not detectable. So you've got, what, infinity for D? I mean, so you're going to have to exposure. It depends upon sensors. And we're going to get into sensors a little bit later, if we have time. Because right now, the concept of sensors tends to be awfully perimeter-oriented. And Perimeters don't exist anymore. So if we assume that our detection is a perimeter detection, I think you've walked into a failure by definition. Types of detections are going to be multifaceted, need to be multifaceted throughout the network. And we can get into that again. I don't have all the drawings here to do it, but I'll be happy to send it to you. The exposure time becomes the whole. 
Anybody know how long the average APT lasts before it's detected and reacted to? The average actually, according to you know, the studies I like to listen to, 436 days. <laughs> Whether that's three months, six months, or 436 days, in my mind, that's all pretty damn much equal. That's an average? Those are averages. And just read the studies. I don't, I don't do studies. I don't do research. My name is not Verizon. <laughs> so this is part one of what is obviously a much lengthier eight-hour presentation on beginning to think analog. So we're going to take this and we're going to kind of put it off to the side for the moment and look at another element. How many of you were in the military? Yeah, show of hands to my back. That's really good. Military, anybody? Okay, what, what's the branch? Air Force. Okay. You were in the Air Force. Then you, sir, are going to define this for me. Define. You're in the Air Force. Act. The OODA loop was created by Colonel John Boyle down at Maxwell when he was teaching in the early 1980s, and unfortunately he died very young. And it is, from military terms, observe what's going on, orient yourself, put it in context, decision making, whether it's local or Pentagon, wherever else, then finally an act. All of these have the same component. They all have a time component, don't they? So when we look at the shock and awe that we did in Iraq in 1991, that entire process was six months long. Then we did six weeks of acting. But throughout that whole process, what we're really looking for is to take this OODA loop concept, and you can put them wherever you want to put them, I don't care, and they then have time vectors that are part of the process. By just its very existence, each one has a time component. The object of the exercise in any OODA loop in the military, and think of this as also working in your real life, think of it as a marketing. I got an idea. I'm going to test market. See what I sell. Adapt. Make it red. Make it blue. And my way I'm going to make profit on the time scale, and there's two time scales here, I'm not going to get into the craziness of it, is you want T, in both cases, to approach zero. Why? Why? Fail fast. What? Fail fast. Fail fast or succeed fast. Fail fast. If you want to be negative, get the hell out of here. <laughs> Approaching zero, you're never going to hit zero because every single one of these certainly has a quantification to it, absolutely. But the object is, in order to save lives in the military, you need to be able to react, make decisions really, really quickly, hopefully accurately, and then do the whole thing all over again, and it becomes a continuum. The continuum of the OODA loop, and if you imagine this OODA loop as a ball rolling, and I have awesome graphics for this that I can't draw, and yet that circle gets smaller and smaller. The efficacy of that case of military operation increases. If we take this same concept and say, how would that work with time-based security? We start seeing now we have two analog functions that work in the physical world. Is anybody at this point even thinking or have thought or begun to implement this in the virtual world? That was a half a finger, or was that the middle finger? I couldn't tell. <laughs> point and implementing, why not? And I'm not asking, I'm curious. Still doing the education in trying to think from a analog viewpoint. Uh, it's actually, uh, it's not all that hard. Uh, again, it's, it's sensor-based. If you look at a sensor-based society, it changes around. 
So we have the whole OODA loop thing. It works, came from the military, works in marketing, manufacturing, JIT. Everybody remember JIT from the 80s? Just in time manufacturing. Let's get that cycle going faster. That's what SAP was supposed to do. So for $100 million in software, you can speed up your delivery really fast, right? So now let's put this one over to the side and come up with another element. Who knows what feedback is? What's feedback? Basically the output influencing the input. Output influencing the input. Perfect. So I have an action, a box, a process, whatever word you want to use. I don't care. You got an input. You got an output. Jack, doesn't this sound like our conversation earlier? You have an input, an output, and a processing thing going on. Fundamental basis of all computing from 6,000 years ago to today. Identical. With feedback, I'm going to have some influence based upon some criteria. Now, in the real world, the first industrial engineering application of feedback was what? Anybody? Who studied history? Who knows technology? Who has ever read a book? <laughs> the what? No, before the Ford process. 200 years before the Ford process. What? Anybody? Steam engines with governors. Everybody knows what a governor is. And we've, and back in the 70s, we used to rent U-Haul trucks and disconnect them because they had the 55-mile-an-hour Nixon speed limit rule in it. And that really sucked driving across country at 55 miles an hour. We moved the governor, which was a speed control. Steam engines, they all have governors. And you've probably seen the spinning bells that go around. It just is a me mechanism for controlling how much power can go out. Reason. Without feedback in a mechanical system, you end up in what is called a runaway condition. We would call that today maybe chaos, lots of different terminologies, but fundamentally the same thing. Now, I used to be an audio engineer. What did feedback mean to me? My ears, that's why I'm deaf now, thank you. What does feedback mean in the audio world? All right, okay. Our input is the microphone. We have an amplifier. It's the same thing, the output is an impact Exactly. In this case, instead of mechanical, we're in an acoustic world. Everybody following me? I, I try to get through this whole thing really, really quickly. Now, I grew up as an electrical engineer, so I'm not going to do the tubes for you. But a simple, simple, most fundamental schematic for amplification, that's the symbol for an amplifier, and you have an input called a negative and a positive input because we're operating in a, uh, in a full circuit mode. One goes to ground, ignore the electronics here. We have an input of some sort, typically goes into the negative input, the amplifier, and I have an output. If I do this, what happens? What happens? Well, nothing. nothing? No, wrong answer. Signal's amplified how much? And what's the gain here? By definition. Go back to the steam engine example. It's infinite. Who said infinite? It's infinite. It's infinite gain. By definition, an amplifier is infinite gain. And we learned this, believe it or not, back with the first feedback loops and transistors and, I'm sorry, tubes back in like 1919. You have to have, resistor, a negative feedback to be able to control and then stabilize how much gain is actually occurring there. This is all analog. If I add that and make it a potentiometer, we call that a volume control. Everybody after me, volume control. So we've got mechanical feedback, keeping a runaway condition. Runaway condition in acoustics is the speakers and the microphones. And in electrical circuits, this is the fundamental model. So what actually happens if you wired up that If the volume goes away, you end up with infinite gain. And in today's circuitry, it would blow up the output transistors. You don't do that. 
Want to repeat after me? Do not do that. That's all the time you get is once. That's right. So what we've got here is we've got time-based security model there. We've got the OODA loop model here. Now we have some fundamental feedback mechanisms here. In common, they're all analog functions. And we have one gentleman in the room who's thinking about, because it's a tough problem and it's new thinking, about how to apply this kind of stuff to network security. Let's add one more piece. How many of you love your spouse? All right, dude, you. Uh, yeah, your hand. No, you, your hand went up. I got gotcha. you. How much you love her? A lot. If your life was in her hands and somebody was giving her millions and billions of dollars and everything, would you still trust her with your life? Depends how early yeah, it depends. <laughs> All right. I got the one word I wanted out of this. It depends. There are boundary conditions where we enter into a new thing that we never use in our world, unfortunately. It's called trust factor. Trust factor is zero. We'll just call him Osama bin Laden, for lack of any other word. <laughs> Pick somebody else. And then I'm arbitrarily using a, a 0.0 to a 1.0 scale because it's easy. And one is absolute 100% total complete Trust. <laughs> How many of you apply a trust factor model to any of your administrative controls? Now, how do you judge if somebody's trustworthy or not? Lots of different factors. In other words, it's analog. It is absolutely analog. Oh, shit, more analog. I can't say shit in a university, can I? I'm sorry. <laughs> Is this a Christian university? Yeah. No shit. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Fuck, I said shit. So, th so this is absolute. The reality is there's a lot of mitigating sort of things. And one of the things that we use, for example, in establishing am I going to give you complete control of my network is have you ever been arrested? Yep. What does that mean? You've never been arrested. What does it mean? Who said that? <laughs> Get up here and finish the damn talk. You're so smart. <laughs> That's right. You haven't been caught yet. But I'm allowed to ask you about your religious affiliations, aren't I? Nope, not in America. It ain't. And I'm not allowed to ask a whole boatload of questions. So trust factor is something that we are very, very fuzzy on in here, and an awful lot of it in our network administration world, giving people uh, the keys to the kingdom, is a hope and a prayer that they're not going to. Snowden was somewhere inside the middle of that zero to one, motivation notwithstanding. He certainly was not a one, <laughs> given what he did. Was he a zero? I don't know. But certainly somewhere in the middle, they decided with all the clearance procedures and all the crap that the DOD does, that they would allow him to take the most sensitive stuff from hither and put it into yon, and it was all good because he passed his stuff. Same thing with the head of counter-Soviet intelligence for the CIA and the FBI. And what was the reason that they never got caught? We go back to number three. No periodic vetting and review based upon an indefinite and incorrect assumptions on sensors. You make $60,000 a year and you buy a $560,000 house for cash and two Jaguars. I call that a sensor worth investigating to trigger a revetting process using a feedback loop with trust factor. <laughs> HR hates this stuff, but when I've talked to HR about this, they hate this stuff. But I'm thinking as a security geek. So we have component four, and ultimately, believe it or not, I'm going to glue all this stuff together. But there's one more element. But back to the... 
So, in our networks, how many of you have implemented what you may do with your spouse? So you trust your spouse, you said, not 12 hours a day. So she's at a point five. Whoa, dude. What's her name and number? <laughs> Often, large financial institutions, and you may have seen them for all of you that get your big annuity checks, signature one, signature two. All right, Mr. Air Force, how do you launch a nuke? This is not, this is serious stuff that, what? And how is two-person integrity done when you launch a nuke? Each person has a two-year code, they each enter it within a high threshold. Within a what? A high threshold. A what? Time threshold. Ah, so they have a small window of analog time by which they must synchronize the keys, otherwise the other guy gets to shoot the other one, and that's, they gotta write that shit down too. Stuff down. No, they're in the same location, separated between 20 and 40 feet, depending upon the nature of the facility. That's all classified. Do not repeat it. Let me show you our networks. And I'm going to use just some crazy symbology here. And this box is a process. It's an action. It's whatever. It's a decision-making box. Today, we have dead marker. If there's any way, anybody has a marker, I have no cash with me. I gave it to my wife to get on a plane last night. We have a switch. and In old electrical terms, we call this a normally open switch. You walk into a room and the switch is off, you turn it on, you close it. So, in this case, we're going to call this guy Admin A. He takes the action, which is the input to the process, correct, Jack? So this process action, I don't care what term you like, and it takes effect, whatever that happens to be. This is the way we administer everything. Any examples that are contrary to what I'm stating here? Anybody? Normally closed circuit would, we're not going to go, you're, that's advanced stuff, don't go there yet. <laughs> Keep it simple. So, oh, thanks so much. Is this the same color? Is that the same color? Yeah. Oh, cool, thanks. I'm also deficient in the uh, retinal cones. So, this is the way we're running the network now. I maintain that after 30 years of me being in this business, computers have existed for 60, pick a number. Why the hell are we still running any of our networks with single man control? It costs twice as much to do it the other way. It does? Yeah. How about if I solve that problem for you? <laughs> then will you go build this and give me the code so I can make money? Well, cool. Good, I want, I need the code. You, you, we'll do a deal later. So what we're going to do then is we'll take the next step of the two-man control and launching a nuke. So I got a guy, and I got a guy, and there's the nuke, and they both got to push that button within some period of time, and there's a little time thing there, in order to launch the nuke. So if I take this from a network standpoint, got a guy who's admin A, he goes, I want to give the president some access, whatever. And then, oh, but the president doesn't get access until Bob agrees. Got it. What's wrong with this model? Well, it, it requires that both of them are there. No, it doesn't. We have a thing called remote access these days. What's wrong with this model? They could deny it. Does that make it good or bad? Is that what's wrong with the model? Time. Time. Because admin A is sitting there reacting to the boss saying, I need access to this crap now. He presses the button. Bob has to authorize it because it's uber access. Where's Bob? He is again. 
So A takes an action, B cannot confirm the action or authorize it, and authorize is a good security term we all love, so therefore the president's going to get pissed off at A and go bypass all the controls, but it's a two-man rule system. Now we're going to solve the problem. So, you do listen. Good for you. <laughs> what we're going to do is apply feedback to, to the eraser that I just lost. Whatever. What we're going to do, I don't care. We're going to have our guy, Admin A, and he is going to make some sort of decision into some sort of process box. Oh, you took the eraser. Oh, see, I'm bad, not you. Thanks. So A is going to make the decision, and the, the process is going to be whatever it is, and out it goes. But we got to have the two-man rule. So my two-man rule, in fact, I'll give you the perfect example of how this works before I draw it. You go to the office, use the key, open the door and the security in your office. What's the first thing you have to do? Turn on the lights. <sighs> no, dude, you don't turn on the lights. <laughs> They're automatic. We're living in the 21st century. The lights automatically come on. What's the, what's the first thing you do? So you have to run like hell to the closet, open the thing, enter a code, and disarm it. Feedback loop, isn't it? So at the trigger, when that event goes high, it triggers a clock. It's like I said, I'm stick figure challenge. Shit. Oh, stuff, sorry. Before Administrator B can approve it, go in and complete it. Anybody missing this yet? I see a few questions. Now, I'm going to translate this into Boolean logic, and it may help a little bit. I want to have an AND function. So we're going to have an A and a B input. So on the output, I'm going to have guy A trigger it high. But B is still low, because Bob's not around. But I want to fix this by putting a feedback loop in here that comes down and triggers that high for X amount of time only until Bob actually does the final approval process. So if that is set to the alarm in your office, 10 seconds, 30, however long it takes before the cops get called, exact same process in what we're talking with time-based security, applying feedback loops, and we're not going to get into the trust factor considerations just yet. There are electronic circuits that were designed for this in the 19, what, Jack, in the 60s, I guess it was, JK flip-flops, Boolean logic, which came out from, Bool everybody studied Boolean logic? Right, wait a minute, I got one yes and a lot of I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Boolean logic. All I'm doing here is applying an analog feedback loop to otherwise digital circuits. Only thing I'm doing. This guy's going, what the hell is he talking about? Now, the cool part about this is, once you start getting this into your head about how time-based feedback can work in a highly sensor-oriented environment, which I grant the more sensors, the more of these kind of loops, the code for this, um, I just coded a few of these basic gates. I think it was 17 lines of code or something. It was really minuscule. Why are we not employing this, at least at the admin levels of routers? Why aren't we applying it at root controls of anything? 17 lines of code. Sorry? We do this. It, where? Oh, Oak Ridge. <laughs> yeah, they've been, you know, Oak Ridge has actually been, Oak Ridge has actually been listening to some of my work over the years. Now, the cool part about this 
is let's look at more of a typical network. We're going to use the OR function in this case. Sorry for my drawing. Do I just have admin A with access to do a network change? How many do I have? Five or six. Five or six. Okay. So we're going to do our dots and we're going to call it N. So effectively, right now, we're running not an AND gate for confirmation and authorization. We're running a run out of control back to our amplifiers with no control mechanisms. Any of these guys can do, take an action in the network, and there is no supervisory control, unless you're going to go to your IDS logs and some of the SIM things. Then we're back to the detection and reaction problems again that we have with time. So in order to solve a problem like this, we can combine the OR functions and allow that to occur to then go into an AND function, put the time, the feedback loop into it, and create the authorization path regardless of the administrator. This requires a little bit of coding, and I've actually found code generators for this. It was really kind of cool the other day. It was from some code developed by a university in 1983 that still actually works on my Mac, which astounded me. Paul, how you doing? What? What's C? I'm no coder. It, it, it ran and it worked, and it gave me pretty pictures and truth tables. I don't code. I don't know anything about engineering, remember? But you can apply the feedback loop into your AND functions. Not your OR functions are, are the weakness in your network. Now this gets back to trust factor. So let's take a simple OR, and we're just going to say we have two trusted admins. And because of the trust factor table, which would be arbitrary, each company organization would set up its own based upon I know code really well, I know Unix, I know the president's wife really well, I shouldn't know the president's wife, uh, but I have various criteria, some of which may be legal vetting, maybe credit scores, everybody's got all these things, uh, university degrees, certifications, and you're going to end up with people with a trust factor somewhere between zero and one. That's just an arbitrary scale I found easy to use. So let's say I've got two really trusted guys. I've got Adam and I've got Bob. Now let's say, because we're in an OR function, because you can't OR, I'm not even going to go to your five or six guys just yet. We're going to say A, Bob, uh, the first Adam, equals a 0.9. We trust him a whole lot, but not with his wife's life. We're going to say Bob has a trust factor of 0.9. What's my total trust factor over here? 21. 0.81 is the correct answer. This is very, very simple uh, statistics. That you, Statistics 101 stuff. No magic. I'm not creating anything. I am gluing together disparate concepts into a single whole. Now, what ends up happening, and I'm not going to run all the formulas for you because I can't do them all out of my head. I am able, in the OR functions, to very simply degrade my network trust factor by adding a whole bunch of people that I'm giving control to with no feedback because I'm going to be running out of control. Where I reinforce... I have to throw a tangent there. A tangent or something in the middle that belongs? Well, it, 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 let's see where it goes. Fair enough. Harry, let's see where it goes. Harry, trying to... Anytime, anytime we talk about trust in our technology realm... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And where we tend to fail catastrophically is in managing revocation. Mm -hmm. All right, you wanted the revocation. Okay, oh, no, no problem. No, hold on. I'll draw. I'll draw you the model. Here's the model. It's real simple. No, no, no. Here, here's the model. Real simple. I'm just going to use a simple AND function here. Okay. I didn't want to go here, but. In this case, we go to where he was talking, you have normally closed conditions. After I've set my normally open to a normally, I've triggered it, I've gotten my time back, my feedback, and I've got a high condition out, I then am reverting to a normally closed condition. 
You want to induce revocation? Do it through a feedback mechanism. Depends upon what your initial condition and state is, normally open or normally closed. Does that answer your question? For now? For now. We'll argue later? I like arguing. It's all sorts of fun. So, I am not. I'm just up here with the chalkboard now. So, with the OR function, we lose according to Statistics 101. However, with feedback mechanisms, my security goes up, measurably so. So, if I have an input of guy A, and I don't remember all the math because there are some formulas, apologize, there, do I want, what level of trust must I necessarily have for the guy in my feedback loop? What? Greater than the first guy is the correct answer. Greater than, sometimes I could argue equal to guy, and I'm not sure that I'm convinced on that, but greater than or equal to. These are the five pieces of analog thinking that I tend to believe if we integrate it into applications, into networks, into systems, throughout our networks and ended up with proper reaction channels, proper detection channels with enough sensors because we don't have enough sensors in our networks right now. My belief is that we could begin to approach where we were in the 1970s. In the 1970s, we were secure. Well, we were secure, okay. We used a thing called mathematical formalization to be able to prove mathematically the security of a particular coded process. In the last 40 years, we've lost that. We're trying to employ digital techniques using binary mindsets. And I have no earthly clue how to do this digitally, which is what was bothering the hell out of me for so many years. I'm seeing new products and new vendors have been putting all, but finally hit me is we need to approach it completely differently. We are analog creatures. Security, as we hear from everybody, is an analog function caused by humans doing messed up analog stuff and pushing buttons that then create these chain reactions and out of control events. What I'm hoping to get across to you is to look at, and if you guys want the PowerPoints, I'll send them to you, no problem at all, big ass PDFs, oh, big PDFs, I can't say that here. And you can work your way through this and challenge me and hopefully challenge the industry to begin thinking about approaching our network security as a dynamic process and not a static process. So I've condensed eight hours of this with no slides into some messy, messy boards, and I'm going to ask for questions, comments, otherwise we can take a break. But, oh, a lot of hands going up. All right, uh, Air Force guy, with respect, you go first. What, what, what's the baby step approach? In my opinion? Like, what's the, what's the first thing, the first step? I'm viewing this, uh, if I... I'm hoping to find a few coders that'll work with me. I got my patent attorney in place to be able to then get money out of Cisco and all the other guys to actually start implementing this as a formalized process. So it's a, it's a matter of establishing, taking all this crap, this is patent processing kind of stuff, the mathematics is trivial, and then coding the elements because the elements in when you're in a Boolean world, even in a Boolean world with feedback, you can do concatenation. So is putting this mindset in the policy before the technology is there to try to make a I've never been asked the question. I have no earthly idea. I'm going to have to think about it. Oh, I didn't, I didn't take it that way. Right. I don't. I, I think pieces of it could. For example, 
we're, we're, there are a couple of feedback mechanisms being currently used. Um, if I go into uh, my Bank of America account and I want to do something, I have it set up in such a way as that it requires a secondary authorization by me in a feedback loop, and that feedback loop I use typically as my mobile device. Now that is a self-referential feedback loop instead of the real world, but the con concept, we're starting to use the concept a little bit here and there. The, uh, Jack, your Google kind of thing, two-factor authentication has a time base. The original security dynamics, now known as RSA tokens, are valid for 30, 60 seconds, and then there's a synchronization thing that occurs in the back end. So my goal initially would be to take all of this and code it into modules and then extort money out of big companies. I think what you were saying was more a case of revamping change control policy. This should be enough of a meta principle to be able to be way the hell up here. Oh, you're about, well, this is going to be, I, I, I don't know. I don't know how to, uh, we, that's another guess. The breakdown for me is the trust factor. Let's it's arbitrary. It's arbitrary and self-referential to your own organization only. It yeah. cannot, you can't take your trust factor methodology and apply it to his. It only can be self-consistent. It's not an absolute, it's a relative function. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I have no way of changing that, rehiring, whatever. Okay, so I have to place a higher level of trust in the feedback loop. Okay? Yep. Well, how can I know that I can trust the feedback loop? One. Wait, 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 be, be, before you continue that, when you say trust the feedback loop, are you saying trust the human in the feedback so loop? How do, how do I set the, the trust factor for the feedback loop and know it's a combination. No, you have the trust factor in, in your particular, in that case, you got, okay, you got your untrustworthy guy down here, and we'll call him a point six, just for argument's sake. If you hire anybody less than this, that's on you. So over here, we have to have anybody greater than point six. The higher that number, the greater your output trust factor will be. No, the amplifiers are, are, are a metaphor for feedback because you don't have to, this is not an app, this is a Boolean application of feedback. But, but to, to, to code this up, you're saying, mm -hmm. eventually that feedback is going to be a digital process or, a, or it's not necessarily going to be a person. How do you establish No, that is a person. I am saying this is part of the two-man rule. This is the this is a human confirmation, okay. a, a human reauthorization. The other guy get ready to trigger the nuke within a two second window. Okay. It's not a, the automatic process is the initial approval for X amount of time, because then and again the math all works out. My ex, remember we talked about uh, up here exposure time. When I take exposure time and relate it to trust factor and put it into the feedback loop, I can start quantifying the damage to my network for the risk people. How many people in the room have been asked, how much is this going to cost the company if we lose data? That's not our freaking jobs. Our job is to tell the risk people, the way you have it configured now, the network could be open for 1.4 hours. Not my job to tell you how much that's worth. And that's been a failure from management standpoint to recognize the differentiation and failure from InfoSec standpoint not to have a model that we could communicate. And the metric, the common metric for all security I'm suggesting is time. Are you suggesting that this is universally applicable to all business processes? Or there I have solved every problem in the entire universe on the board, yes sir. <laughs> I have no idea. I'm thinking about it from a network standpoint. Um, I do know that these the pieces do have universal applicability. I do know that they largely make common sense. Otherwise, we'd have had a lot more argument a lot earlier. The only thing I have to wonder here is, 
you know, yeah. with, with the two men rule implemented kind of not in series, where you have some sort of defined time window, mm -hmm. um, you know, for governing a risk. Yep. In today's digital age, right, given the speed with which information can propagate and there's multiple channels over which things could go, mm -hmm. are there scenarios where this would just not... Oh, I am... Uh, that's a good question. He's saying, is this going to screw up my, my entire operation? I am not suggesting by any means to apply this everywhere. I'm saying that in certain cases, it's absolutely incredible to me that we don't have it in critical admin locations. Do you want one guy launching a nuke? I saw that TV, uh, that movie too. But I think that's the answer to his comment. Where we, we did this in about three places where it was critical. Remote access by a domain admin. That's precisely where we have that. I'm not saying do it everywhere. I'm saying this is hopefully a universal conceptual tool that is an analog function that you should choose where to implement it based upon your needs. It's like, okay, I just built a switch. I don't know what the hell you're going to use the damn switch for, but I own the patent on the switch. So do you want it everywhere? Do you want it? Where it really got to me, what's the dirtiest four-letter word in the English language that relates to security? <laughs> that I can say in this university. You're a dirty old man. Risk? No. That's a, nah, you're wrong, Air Force. The first one is user. What's the second one? What? Who are you? <laughs> the second one is root. And that, so, at any rate, this all really propagated from my entire distaste and what I have seen going wrong with root control, insider threat problems, and more and more today with increased sensors that are needed in the networks, uh, the users phishing, social engineering, we apply no feedback mechanisms whatsoever in any of the user process, nor in the root process. Apply it everywhere? I have no idea yet. I'm going to write a book about it and figure it out. Yes, sir. The, the, the sudo is a little bit of a negative example of what you're doing. If you, if you type in sudo and you're, and you're not a sudoist, you, you get a message saying this will be reported. Whereas it should be your, all your sudo actions are being reported. Mm -hmm. And the positive example of that is not Google's authentication, but the Google's um, act, account activity. Right. So you get a, a feedback, hey, why would I want to see what I've done? We'll make sure that there's. You're applying the differentiation between RACF, ACF2, and that third one that existed in the 70s. Whether you're in an all-on or an all-off condition, is you're reporting based upon this side of the tilt or this side of the tilt. So that's your call. And the, and the thing is, it's not whether Bob's a 9 or a 0.6. It's whether it's Bob or not, because it's remote access. And is it a stolen credential, or is it really Bob? Or not? Yeah, but the, oh, hold on. Hold on. If I'm in a remote access, if I don't have one of these processes already going on in my remote access, that's bad on me. So if I've got there and I've got B and up here is some remote guy A, I haven't even approached speci the specificities of how to apply this. I do have the circuitry to apply this for authentication, whether it's local authentication or remote authentication. So you'd want to apply that separately, that would be one of the places I would argue is very, very important to do it, is apply this concept. So just because you have this concept at an access control point doesn't mean you don't have it at an authentication standpoint as well. It's applicable in many places, and you're going to come up with more of them. It's absolutely spot on comment. Uh, I just want to make sure we have one minute left, otherwise we stay. Can I what? Um, I'll give you my cards, because uh, my handwriting really sucks. Do I have, yeah, do I have 20 cards? Uh, do I have 20 cards? Yeah, they're up here, I'm not, and I, I may have a few more. Have any what? Sticker, dude, I came here to attend. <laughs> I have no little dead puppy stickers. I'm sorry. So any on, on this before we break, any other thoughts, comments? Yes, sir. Uh, 
Um, I, can you reword that? I'm, I think I know what you're saying, but I'm not clear. Because you can't add them. The problem is it's not additive. Uh, it's, it's, it's essentially statistical. But the problem is, is that in any, in any reasonably large organization, your trust factor is never that big. And so you have a problem, basic problem of, even if you have the second guy being more trustworthy than the first, you still have two guys make a tough decision and your trust. Then, what would you, then how would you suggest fixing it? I, I, I don't know. Higher, smarter, more reliable, vetted people where you're allowed to ask, are, they gonna, are you going to bomb us tomorrow because you're of an insane, extreme belief? But the, We're not allowed to do that. I, I don't do the human factors, thank God. I have no clue. But I do know that some companies have five weighting factors. Some have 20 weighting factors. The, the short answer is what you're trying to do is instead of multiplying the point nines, they have a point eight one chance of you're trying to multiply the point ones to get a point oh one probability of failure. Yeah, you, if you do that, I mean, if you're at 0.1s already, why are they there? No, no that is part of it. Because the, 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 as part of your organization, I would argue that HR and security would have minimum thresholds based upon the relative scales. It's like the relative scale of audio is real simple. You, you have a baseline. And you pick some arbitrary baseline, doesn't matter what it is, and then you, re you measure relative to that. And when you're measuring relative to something, then it's at least, oh, you need to be self-consistent. Even in the case of something like NSA, the problem is, is that you have a mountain of data, and you've got way too much data to analyze, so you've got to lower your threshold in order to get enough people to analyze all the data. I don't know that that's necessarily true because what you've just added in is another time function. And the other time function is the uh, data divided by time, which also means bandwidth. How much, can a, how much data can a particular person go through in what period of time then becomes an additional potential feedback filter. I'm not here with every freaking answer. <laughs> I'm here with some ideas at the last minute. You guys have been awesome. Thank you. We'll talk to you later.